Thank you very much, Jeff, for the very nice, kind introduction. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Aaron Leo, Research Fellow at uh, QUT. Um, as uh, Jeff mentioned, that uh, I'm part of our QUT uh, Australian Renewable Energy Agency Affordable Heating and the Cooling Innovation Hub project, and I'm responsible for Queensland Children's Hospital um, Living Lab, and that's on the healthcare side. Um, and here today, I'm um, to, to discuss with you the aged care energy security and impact of lockdown and some um, investment or energy planning findings so far. <clears throat> we highly appreciate support from ARENA and uh, Australian Institute of Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heating, Bolton Clark and other uh, SMEs. So a, a bit of vision or why or how um, we are motivated to do the work we are doing now is um, economical and sustainable energy for the healthcare sector. That includes uh, hospitals and aged care facilities. Um, here are some uh, global initiatives to promote that. So here, um, today I'm going to first discuss our healthcare energy and emission overview um, for a couple of minutes, then talk about uh, aged care and needs and forecast for the coming 30 years for Australia. And then we talk about the energy performance at aged care facilities, uh, communities uh, globally and in Australia. After that, uh, we're going to see some nice charts on what factors are associated with energy use at aged care communities. And the later is, um, has lockdown, has lockdown changed energy use and demand profiles at aged care facilities? Let's start. Um, so globally, Healthcare emission is about 4.4% of global net emission. 29% of uh, these emissions are directly related to care facilities and vehicles. And energy use accounts for more than half of the sector's emissions. And if we talk about uh, top 10 healthcare emitters in the world, that uh, Australia, um, in terms of healthcare emission, we're about number 10 in the world. Um, if we talk about the country's emission in total, um, Australia is about number 17 in the world. And if we plot that uh, the healthcare um, emission footprint into the chart on the right, we can see that the uh, United States, China, European Union um, are kind of top three. And Australia, we have 25 million people and we account for about 2% of uh, global healthcare emission in the world. Um, if we talk about uh, healthcare emission per capita base, that um, we are also in the top uh, um, range. So that's uh, over one ton per capita. Um, Australia, Canada, Switzerland, United States are the top four um, in this uh, regard. Um, before I talk uh, more specifically about aged care facilities that um, I would like to maybe make a, a little bit uh, um, a shorter clarification or introduction. Um, residential aged care communities are different are not the same to retirement villages. So on the left, it's more like a, an aged care setting, and on the right, it's more like a retirement village setting or independent living units setting. And at a retirement village, normally we don't need that a higher uh, nursing staff to residents ratio, and uh, residents have their own units or, or even garden or things to do to look after themselves and mostly as well. But uh, on the aged care facility side or community side, that uh, we tend to have 24 seven nursing staff on site, a slightly higher ratio, much higher ratio for um, caring um, our residents on site and also helping people, for example, getting off the bed or move to from private uh, rooms into a, a more public space or to enjoy meals, for example. So it's um, different. Um, Here's an overview of our Australian aged care industry or the whole sector. We have uh, about 2,700 sites. So more precisely is um, 2,695 sites across Australia. And uh, by the end of last financial year, we have the about 183,989 residents living. 70% of them are in major cities, 29% are in regional areas and 1% in the remote area. And the Commonwealth spent about 13.4 billion in the sector um, for residential aged care. And the whole sector employs about uh, 235,000 people. That was a, a, five, 
uh, years ago statistics, and I believe that now must be increased a bit. Um, if we talk about energy, so for our residential aged care facilities, uh, residents, this is 183,000 of them, we spend about $200 million a year for electricity bills. And we have more uh, discussion later on in the uh, webinar. Let's look at the Australian aged care needs over the coming 30 years. So if you look at this chart, um, that uh, we the blue bars are for the current demographics for Australia. So we kind of have more than 1.2 million people in the age group of 65 to 69 and over 1 million in the age group of 70 to 74 and so on. And then in 30 years time, maybe 2050, so the um, green bars, uh, we will have uh, over 1.8 million people living in that um, uh, group. And uh, I was talking to Adriana and uh, Richard that I'm a bit, uh, maybe doing the research for my own purpose as well, because in 30 years time, I will be nearly in that age group. So 1.8 million people. Um, so next one, let's see uh, about the resident number. So the number of residential aged care residents will be nearly doubled in 30 years time. That can be seen from this um, um, figure. So the green line is for the residential aged care residents. The light blue or sky blue line is for Commonwealth Home Support Program. That's for the right hand side uh, axis. And the dark blue is of the home care package. So kind of three levels, different uh, um, care or support packages. Um, so for our fo focus of this webinar, it's more focused on the residential care and you will see the reason why on the next slide. Um, so at the moment, 2020, we have about 183,000 people, uh, residents living. In 30 years time, we'll be nearly doubled. So it's near to 350,000 residents. If you look at uh, Commonwealth expenditure um, over the coming 30 years, so here is about 2020, overlooking into 2050. So the green bars are for the residential care and Commonwealth uh, spending as a percentage of GDP, gross uh, domestic product as a kind of economic figure. Um, at the moment it's about 0.7% and it may be increased to about 0.9% of GDP in 30 years time. I'm not sure if this will be changed or not, uh, depending on um, the findings or recommendations from latest um, uh, Royal Commission investigation. Um, so if you look at uh, more precisely at the energy use at residential aged care communities, um, operational needs may include health services for some um, essential equipment, medical equipment, for example, Community services, so cooking, um, air conditioning at hall or dining places, administration for offices, uh, for nursing um, uh, rooms as well. Residents needs, for example, res uh, space cooling, heating, lighting, appliances, and uh, also reliability is quite important. Um, by law, we need to have uh, five cup uh, generators at residential aged care sites, and also UPS, for example, battery banks and inverters, that's for, for example, communication supply backup. Um, if you look at our Australian energy um, use for residential aged care, New South Wales did an energy audit of 15 um, residential aged care communities. And that's listed, the results are listed on this pie, pie, pie chart. We can see that 44% of electricity was used for heating and cooling and then followed by lighting and the others, that's the remaining. Um, heating and cooling is number one energy user. It's quite obvious. Um, if we move on to, uh, to see this bar chart by month in 2018, this is for a residential aged care community in Southeast Queensland and the vertical axis is kilowatt hour per day. Um, we have quite a lot of legends here, but if you just look at the blue one on the bottom, so that's for the air con, air conditioning, also space and cooling mostly for our Australia, uh, Queensland climate or Southeast uh, Queensland climate. We can see that across the year in every month that air conditioning is the largest energy user of all um, 
So air conditioning uses the <coughs> excuse me, largest amount of electricity. And, uh, which was uh, similar to the New South Wales, but uh, I think our percentage is a bit higher um, compared to New South Wales uh, funding. Um, if, uh, let's move on to Tasmania. Um, Tasmania did an energy audit of nine residential HDKL communities, is uh, including electricity and gas, it's benchmark. So there are the nine um, sites. And um, so the vertical axis is a kilowatt hour per bed per day. You can see that uh, based on this energy use intensity, so kilowatt hour per bed per day, it ranges from 28.8 to 50.7 for the nine sites. And the median value is somewhere around 32.9 kilowatt hour per bed per day. As for the, our Tasmanian nine residential HDKL facilities. How would that compare, um, be compared with our international um, studies? Findings or projects is there a, a um, for some findings summary statistics from 100 care homes in Europe. Um, we call it in Australia we call it aged care or nursing homes. And in Europe, that's a more common name is a care homes. Um, quite a lot of numbers here, but if we focus on the yellow highlighted number or this uh, energy use intensity number two, um, KPI, key performance indicator. And um, it's a kilowatt hour per resident per year. Um, if we convert that, the mean value into per day, we can see it's about 32 kilowatt hour per resident per day, which is quite similar to the Tasmanian finding, the mean value to for the nine um, residential HCAL facilities. And also some other ranges, that's quite big. Um, because this actually 100 care homes uh, started actually investigated from um, Nordic countries all the way to the South of Europe, uh, the 100 care homes in Europe. Next, let's move on to how do residential aged care um, communities seasonal demand profiles look like? And um, so here I plotted the 30 minute electricity demand profile, they're the box plots by seasons. So here's the winter month, spring month, summer month, and autumn month. So if we look at the summer month, the uh, box plot, so we have a maximum value, minimum value for that time stamp, that's kind of midday, noon, and then 75% uh, tail, medium value, and 25% uh, tail. And the red crosses are the um, outliers. Uh, please note that uh, the four seasons are not equally important. And the reason is because uh, in warm and hot climate zones that uh, we tend to have more summer month. For example, for Queensland, or most of Queensland, um, like Southeast Queensland or Northern Queensland, we tend to have uh, maybe it's from October to next year, um, March kind of summer season. Of course, very slightly across the years, but here summer is more important for North Australia. Um, but uh, how would that be the yearly and demand profile look like? So here is a, a similar 30 minute demand towards on the vertical and also half hourly and um, that's the time stamps for the horizontal axis. We can see that um, this is the 2019 for a Southeast Queensland demand profile looking like that. So a question comes up, is this profile similar to a residential demand profile, a home household, or more similar to a commercial demand profile? This has impact for energy planning or investment later on. Um, so normally for home or for a house, we tend to have a morning peak. That's because of cooking or, or waking up or hot water use, for example, and then um, quite flat during the day because got school or got work. And then in the late afternoon, the evening, we tend to have another peak. It's for cooking, for appliances, for entertainment, for example. And then we may have another peak kind of from 11 p.m. For example, for Queensland, that's because hot water heating. Um, so this profile, I don't see it aligning with a um, residential or home uh, demand profile, but uh, it's possibly more similar to a commercial demand profile. Like when the day starts, tend to have ramping up of demands for energy, for electricity. And as the day goes down, not the late afternoon to evening, so it's obviously it's going down for the demand profile as well. Um, another question. Is this profile similar in terms of shape to something else? 
So I was wondering this, looking at that, um, I, I like to visually analyze and present data in a, a more intuitive way. So for me, um, I feel like this is more like a temperature profile, for example, and also it can be quite similar to a solar radiation profile. And th that has some impact later on, uh, I will mention um, in this webinar. So uh, then from this slide on, we start investigating what are the factors influencing energy use and demand. Um, so here is uh, also similarly um, box plots um, for peak demand for energy use per day. But we talk about the zero, that's for the non-work day, and the one is for the work day. Do we see a big difference or there's no significant difference between non-work day and work day in terms of energy or peak demand? Right, there's no significant difference. The next one is, are weekdays or weekends different for our residential aged care communities in terms of peak demand or energy use? So one is like the uh, summer, uh, sorry, Sundays, and Monday, Tuesday, and so on, until Saturday. So the same pattern follows. So is there a big difference in terms of uh, um, weekdays and weekends, energy use or peak demand? Because normally that for commercial properties, we tend to have a, a drop of uh, energy use or peak demand for the weekends. That's because that's, uh, except uh, possible shopping centers, that's quite different. But for offices, educational institutes, for example, um, uh, or industry, for example, we tend to have a bit lower demand or energy use over the weekend. But that's not seen for aged care. But of course, that's a, we may understand that uh, aged care, uh, we don't really have a kind of uh, maybe weekends or because every day possibly quite similar. Um, but what does that mean? Or what's the impact of having that evidence um, doing the visual studies? So day types don't match much for residential aged care energy use and peak demand. And when residential aged care communities can see the low risk on-site uh, generation mature technology such as rooftop PVs, what would happen? So we may expect a higher return on investment compared to office or commercial industry customers because seven days we have similar pattern or energy use. Um, if we put, a, for example, renewable or PV on top roof for an office, often office have um, almost no uses over the weekends. So that uh, return on investment may not be as high as putting um, uh, renewables on our residential aged care. And because that uh, based on current tariff or feed-in tariff or investment scheme, and that uh, maybe the best way or highest return is from use on site rather than exporting. And uh, residential aged care that uh, we have residents 24 seven every day with services provided as well. Um, I personally see it as a cost control measure because if we spend less on energy, it would hopefully have more on the healthcare side. Um, uh, later, I have some ballpark estimates for the impact of doing this. Um, so now let's look at the factor, of, uh, another factor, temperature. Is temperature associated with energy use? So here is a scatter plot. Um, so it's maximum daily temperature against the daily energy use in kilowatt hour. So what do we see here? It's kind of a tick pattern. What does that mean? So somewhere 24, 25, 26 is kind of median or comfortable region. When we have temperature go higher than that, we tend to have more uh, needs for cooling. So that's the energy use goes higher. And if we temperature is a bit lower than that, possibly we need more energy for heating. So that's why. And this analysis will be related to a later energy comparisons for six communities. And, and we study six communities from Cairns to and Southeast Queensland to Sydney. And it'll be later on. Uh, how about the uh, peak demand? So monthly peak demand, if you look at this, um, I also drew a kind of a linear regression. We can see as temperature goes higher, we have monthly peak demand going higher as well. A background question is that why are peak demands important? Mostly um, uh, many reasons. For example, there are two here I listed. And network infrastructure, um, peak demand is a key factor when we do design or construction for our um, network infrastructure like transformer, for example, or cables and conductors. 
And also next, uh, big demand can be part of a building or tariff structure for commercial and also now rolling to residential customers as well. Uh, we understand that energy is the essential supply to make sure that healthcare has um, a reliable and uh, quality healthcare at our um, healthcare facilities or uh, hospitals and aged care. But uh, what if there's a health um, event, like an epidemic, what would that do to our energy, energy use of big demands? So we have studied uh, a six communities and uh, residential aged care communities, energy use and demand in the lockdown. It's published uh, by Energy and Buildings uh, Journal. So that's uh, from Cairns to Townsville to Brisbane to Toowoomba, uh, Logan and Sydney. And key uh, lockdown measures included restriction on visits, entry and exit, and also elimination of site group activities. So here is, is a kind of a we group the six sites by climate zones and Sydney and Toowoomba have similar uh, temperate um, um, climate zone classification. Um, if you look at Sydney, for example, I did a box plot, uh, sorry, um, this is a scatter plot between daily maximum temperature and daily energy use in kilowatt hour. You can see that, uh, um, and also different color, 2018 is the blue circles, 2019 was the orange circle, and also 2020 was the uh, yellow circles. And we can see that in terms of, uh, here's the distribution or a different way of uh, doing the histogram for the temperature that uh, for the three years, 2018, 19, 20, quite similar for the Sydney site. Um, in terms of the daily energy use, also here is the histogram or the distribution. Um, uh, we see that uh, 2020, we tend to have actually similar median and daily peak demand and daily energy use, but the standard deviation is be less or more um, narrow in terms of a look of it. Also, we did a similar study for Toowoomba, but the overall results is that in terms of uh, daily peak demand and daily energy use, there's a, some minor difference between like one or four percent difference if we compare the lockdown and period to previous years. And let's look at the clients and Townsville. So the same method um, was applied. And if we summarize the results of the findings that, uh, so there are some differences compared to previous, previous years in terms of uh, daily pigment and daily energy use. Uh, so for example, for the clients is 0%, no, almost no change to 4% change. And Townsville is about 4% to 11% of change. Um, but if we look at our Southeast Queensland climate, a bit warmer, than the Sydney, but uh, slightly cooler than the and Cairns um, communities. And we have bigger difference um, compared to previous years. So in terms of daily um, demand and the daily energy use, we kind of have a 20-ish percent, like 24%, 23% for the Brisbane community. And for the Logan community, we tend to have 11 to 19% of uh, um, change. So climate seems to be a factor in terms of energy use in lockdown. Uh, how about the renewables? What would the rooftop PVs do if we had them during lockdowns? So here's a table to show renewables impact and in the first lockdown period last year. Um, so if you look at the um, columns first, so here's the PV systems and um, for no PV, no PV for the first two rows as a baseline studies and the later two and three uh, rows here, they are the, if we have one kilowatt peak per bed, also similar one kilowatt uh, peak per bed for the electricity generation or for the emission and the reduction percentage. So Brisbane um, community, Logan, Sydney, Toowoomba, Cairns and Townsville. What we see is that, uh, so I highlight some numbers and <clears throat> that the maximum numbers of that row. So Cairns and Townsville, they have a, a actually reasonably um, slightly bigger size compared to here, the other communities. And also that the mean daily electricity use will be higher, um, also emission will be higher. If we put this similar um, level, like one kilowatt peak um, PV per bed, 
level for six communities. We can see kinds and towns would can generate a little more electricity than other um, sites because they have tend to have more solar radiation. Um, and also because of that, they tend to have more um, CO2 reduction a uh, reduction. So that's here. But in terms of percentage reduction, when we have the same kilowatt hour peak per bed, PV on the roof, Sydney and the Toowoomba sites actually perform the best. Why is that? Because um, they are more like in the temperate climate zone, they use less energy. Um, and it will be more visibly to see that in the next uh, chart uh, diagram. So let's look at the observation. So a bit more summary that, uh, um, so six uh, communities from Brisbane to Logan, Sydney, Toowoomba, Kynes and Tonswell. And I did put the three years KPI here and I uh, used the kilowatt hour per bed per day for the years. And the Brisbane Logan, similar climate, Sydney, Toowoomba, similar climate, Kynes, Tonswell, similar climate. And this orange uh, line is for the number of uh, bed um, at um, each community. So what's the observation? Larger communities tend to have lower energy use intensity. So that's like an energy use per bed level, like the uh, Brisbane community has more beds compared to the Logan. So they tend to have lower energy use per bed compared to the Logan community. And the climate plays a significant role in energy use because hot regions and energy use intensity tend to be higher than the warm regions and the warm regions energy use intensity tend to be higher than the temperate regions. That's, for example, this hot region, warm region and the and temperate region. Um, if we do a bit of ballpark estimate for our 183,000 residential HK residents, and let's consider 20 kilowatt hour per bed per day. That's not far away from the um, uh, figure, real figures, side figures. And if we take a 15 cents as the energy um, price for the um, electricity, um, and this is uh, lower than our home average electricity price already. So our yearly electricity bill for the 183,000 residents for our residential aged care sector will be somewhere around $201 million a year. If we use a balanced energy investment strategy, like considering rooftop PVs, climate costs, investment, or so MPV, net present value, for example, and ongoing maintenance, uh, the yearly savings can be somewhere around $40 million to $60 million. Um, uh, I don't want to bore you um, with uh, the mathematics, so that has been published somewhere uh, in that uh, Renewable Energy Journal that we recently published. So I see that if we have a 40 million to 60 million dollar and savings every year, that can be put back to the care side and rather than spend on the electricity. Um, uh, we are working on some other aspects of uh, renew, uh, residential aged care as well, like a heating electrification to encourage um, and we move from the fossil fuel to heating sites to more electrification, use electricity as a, a source of energy. So what we have learned so far, residential HDKL demand profile can be more similar to commercial, but with more potential to enable local renewables. And temperature and climate are key factors for energy use and peak demand at residential HDKL facilities. And the rooftop PV continues to perform regardless of uh, lockdowns. Um, our vision will come true, or is coming true, um, with teamwork. Here's a, a list of some of our um, partners that uh, we have uh, uh, partnered with the uh, Australian Renewable Energy Agency and Queensland Government, um, Children's Hospital, um, ERA, A2EP, and also we have uh, industry support as well, Bolton Clark, uh, Oregon Health, um, Synergical GMG, and other um, uh, Australian local companies here. At, this is for heat pump and for, for example, from based on Mel Melbourne company for um, digital twins. And also we are collaborating with uh, research institutes across Australia, working for a range of different projects like IHA projects, like RACE 2030 Corporate Research Center projects, 
to encourage um, heating electrification for commercial industry and the healthcare, and also building 4.0 and CRC. Also at the same time, that's, sorry, because of limited space, I cannot put that many logos here. We have a partner with the architecture companies and consulting firms and the construction companies to, do, to break disciplinary boundaries to design um, engineering and uh, high performance and health and also other outcomes and considered uh, buildings for our aged care facilities. That's for integrated design studio. Thank you. Uh, that's all uh, my presentation. I welcome all questions, comments, and feedbacks. Thank you. Excellent, Aaron. Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation and for guiding, uh, guiding us through uh, it very with very good explanation of everything you've uh, done and how you analyze your results as well. And uh, I'd like to welcome any questions from the audience. And by all means, um, start up your camera if you'd like to. I, I, I think we may be able to ask the questions in person because no one has uh, put any questions in the chat. If you don't want to ask any question in person, Put it in the chat, please, and I'll read it out to Aaron. Thank you. Do you need to stop sharing, uh, Adriana? No, no, we, we keep recording. Yep. Yeah, we keep recording. All right, if no one, uh, I, I will give people a little bit of time to think <laughs> about their question. Um, Aaron, um, are there any recommendations that you will be um, giving to, to the owners of these uh, care facilities? Yes. As ba based on your findings? Yes, that's a really good question. Uh, we're doing ongoing research with uh, um, HCAL providers across Australia and also research institutes and with uh, different support from industry association and uh, governments um, and the government owned uh, organizations. Um, Let's say you mentioned the recommendations, right? I, I feel that's a very good question. Actually, I'm working on that at the moment. Um, Jeff will be one of my collaborators as well. Um, so uh, what triggered me about that thought, I will mention very shortly, but that originated from this chart. What do we see from here is that um, looks like we have uh, um, three levels, like here is one level, another level of energy use per person or per bed. And, no, and another level. So I was thinking, what are the KPIs, key performance indicators that we can um, recommend or, or somewhere rough figures? Of, of course, there's, there's no um, one size fit all for investment, investing in our residential aged care facility energy assets, for example, I believe. Um, but uh, there may be, uh, we may be able to generate some recommendations or selection of uh, KPIs. So we can make recommendations or do planning quite more efficiently and accurately. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that idea comes from this chart. Is that at uh, Sydney or Toowoomba, maybe we need a kind of, a, if say, uh, very roughly, um, one or slightly more than one um, kilowatt peak per bed um, for the rooftop PV. But for Brisbane, Logan, a bit more. And uh, Kyan's Tonsil hot and climate zone, we can recommend them more um, in terms of the uh, kilowatt peak per bed um, investment. And that can be seen from the table before as well. So this one, uh, if we look at Sydney and Toowoomba uh, climate region, that uh, this one kilowatt peak per bed may not be far away from a balanced investment decision for Sydney and Toowoomba climate uh, residential aged care facility. Um, from my um, calculation, before and also that uh, running algorithms that uh, possibly if we can say, let's say we get a return in three years. So that's a kind of 30-ish percent return. So here we've seen it wrong, but we can recommendate slightly more kilowatt peak per bed. Um, but Kynes and the Tonsil looks like within a lot more kilowatt peak per bed. If you look at the figure here, we can alleviate it more. And mm. uh, Brisbane and Logan, um, we need to put also slightly more as well. Um, this is not enough for Brisbane Logan. 
climate. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are the um, um, so limitations or conditions we need to follow, like the site space, and, and also we tend to maybe maximize on-site use rather than export, and also we need the approval as well, right, from utilities. Thank you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm apologize if you've already covered this, but uh, have you got any thoughts about the implications of uh, multi-level uh, facilities as opposed to single story in terms of energy implications? Uh, thank you, David. That's a great question. And um, uh, you're right, uh, and I think possibly because you know the uh, the, the sector. Um, I, I'm working on the innovation hub, uh, affordable heating and cooling project sponsored by Arena and Era. Uh, and uh, you're right, that most of, uh, for example, existing um, health facilities are kind of uh, um, um, flat or one or two floors. But for one of our new um, living lab, we have one brand new building, kind of six floor with 164 beds. And that's a multi bed um, aged care facility. Uh, I cannot provide the results to you at the moment because that building is just finished. And then we have, have quite detailed uh, data and the sensors and the measurements. And we can, um, so that was uh, October last year. So in about another half a year, uh, um, or slightly more time, we'll be able to present some. Uh, if we, we are in, you are interested, we can keep talking and share some knowledge or we can learn something from you. Yeah, exchange ideas as well. Yeah, there, there was some, some interesting research done probably 15 years ago now, looking at, at different housing typologies and it found that the you know, walk-up apartments for Melbourne, this is, were the most energy efficient. And that's partly because they don't have lifts. But as soon as you've got more than one level in an aged care facility, you've got lifts. Yes. Uh, so even, so I imagine that uh, you would want to have a quantum jump from single storey to quite a few storeys to get efficiencies. Yep. Um, rather than those sort of in-between levels. Yeah, but that's just an instinct. <laughs> yes, yes. Have a good question. Thank you, David. Thank you. Any other questions from audience? Well, I will uh, ask another question, Aaron, then. Was there anything that really surprised you some in your studies? Uh, something that you didn't expect to find out? Uh, you're right. Uh, I, I like your question, Adriana, uh, because often I, I, I feel like I do practical research, so I often have a hypothesis. So I think that's the way it should be, you know, and I test it. I use evidence, use data analysis, use figures or uh, visuals to, to present that. So before I do this analysis um, for, sorry, not this one, um, for the change of the, you know, communities, um, uh, in lockdown and uh, compared to previous years, I thought because of the restriction to on-site visits and also an um, elimination of the site activities, I thought the energy use of big demand should be reduced quite a lot across everywhere, you know. <laughs> um, that's because, you know, no, 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 except emergency medical staff, of course, but normal people, uh, even family friends were not supposed to visit, so less um, and is expected to use on-site. Mm -hmm. Also, not uh, almost no group activities at site. So I thought there should be a much bigger job across the board, you know, for all the residential aged care facilities. However, it turns out not true. That's yeah. not the case. Mm -hmm. It depends on places or climate. Um, for us, that the six communities are managed by the same um, community. Uh, sorry, the same and uh, not for profit uh, aged care group. Um, so that uh, the philosophy of management uh, principle is similar. Um, and it looks like uh, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Sydney at one, but the temperature regions actually tend to have uh, almost this kind of minus one and four. It's quite a minor, really minor change. Mm -hmm. But for um, our um, Brisbane weather, the climate or areas that we tend to have a lot more change. So yeah, that's what surprised me. Mm. 
Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Our fellow researcher, um, Glenn, um, Glenn Crompton, may be able to share some knowledge, knowledge in the future. Let's say he um, has some data or has some information on why that's the case. Okay, so he's continuing, he's continuing, he's yes. continuing. Yes. Oh. yes, in the future. Yeah. Good, good. Well, we may have him share his yeah, well, uh, Yes, it's, it, it, it's, it's Glenn here, Adriana. Yeah. Uh, yes, Aaron's right. We are still working on that stuff. And, and just what he was saying then about the unexpected oh, uh, results from the lockdown, we, we thought it would um, show some differences. And from the bit I've focused on to start with was the, the the bits of the energy which are not weather dependent so lighting and so on so we thought that lighting in certain areas uh, as we have some sub metering in place we thought we might find that common areas are used less and residential the individual rooms might be used more mm -hmm. and it didn't really seem to be the case during lockdown that everyone just seemed to within the building use the building the same way it was uh, pre-lockdown so mm. yeah we're still still trying to work out how to present some of that data though <laughs> thank yeah, you good well if, if people are interested in uh further work then by all means please contact aaron and um he can direct them to the right source thank you yeah, thank you thank, yeah, thank you thank you glenn yeah no problem um, well it doesn't look like there are any other questions. Um, I've got a comment, though, I'd like to throw in there. The, big, the slides you had at the beginning, uh, Aaron, showing that uh, the cost of home care versus residential aged care, there seem to be significantly this less. Well, hang on, I haven't got the. This screen. is a Commonwealth uh, um, budget. Forecast. Yeah, the budget ones were saying that the home care is a lot less expensive by the look of things than uh, yep. than, than residential aged care. So I wonder if there'll be a, uh, it, from a financial point of view, it makes sense to, to try and keep people in home care longer than uh, than getting them into residential aged care, which... Um, um, I'm not sure if I should mention that or not. Uh, what you just said is true. Yes. It's yeah, that, already true. That's, uh, people tend to leave the home um, as long as possible. Um, yes. And also, yes. that's um, often is um, sad to mention that actually. Um, yeah, that's, so that's that's what I thought was the the thing. I mean, I'm an engineer, not an aged care expert, so I wasn't really don't don't really feel qualified to comment on on the forecast of where uh, the percentage of elderly residents will live. But yeah, it does sort of make sense that that. Uh, so. Oh, it's not showing up. On, yeah, yeah. So. Yep. Uh, I guess also that some of those numbers might be a bit skewed because in home care, the resident still pays for their energy bills and along with other bills, whereas in residential aged care, it's all covered by the facility. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. that's a good point, yeah. That, that actually prompts another question because with people tending to stay at home as long as they can now, they are generally needing a higher level of care by the time they do move into institutional care. And I'm imagining that that would bring with it higher energy demands. Do, do you know anything about that? Uh, to answer that question, I suppose we need to compare um the aged care community's energy use intensity with home energy uh, use intensity. So for example, at Southeast Queensland, if my memory is right, uh, we are using like kind of a 18 kilowatt hour per day at uh, Southeast Queensland. Um, if we look That's at- That's for a household level, Aaron? Yes, yep. yes, yes. And at our- Aged care, I think the it's not care. far away from that. Yeah, aged care is a slightly more than that. Yeah, yeah depend, in the depends on what the climate, care. depends on the climate, yep. Um, yeah, yeah, slightly more than that. Yeah, the community service uh, part of often is the largest energy use. For example, the community center or, or auditorium or the meeting hall, even if it has no people, that's it's kind of 24 seven 
yes. conditioned. And, and corridors with lights left on and, yep. and so on, all 24 7. Because yeah, all 24 7. So mm -hmm. that's a. Um, maybe that's a place we can improve as well. I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> And be part of your recommendations. Yes, yes. <laughs> Put census. Yeah. All right, well, if there are no more questions from the audience, we may close this uh, seminar session. And by all means, feel free to contact Aaron if um, you would like to um, find out more about his continued research and that of his team. And we hope to see you again in one of our seminars in the future. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you all. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>